<laughs> it's Sunday morning. <laughs> Sunday morning, and we're in a study on the book of Revelation. I was talking to uh, Greg yesterday, and I said, people think that Revelation is a difficult book. That's because you've been told that. And it's because people try to preach it without actually researching it. When I say research it, I'm talking about finding out what all the words in the book means and what all of the, what all of the metaphors and all of the figures of speech and the idioms, what they meant in the first century. We're talking about what they meant in a, new, in a world uh, that was 2,000 years ago in another culture with another language where they didn't think like we think. The reason people can't understand it is because of that very thing. Teaching Revelation, to me, is one of the easiest books to teach because it has so many, so many pointers in it or so many signs, and when you find out what those signs mean, they're the same thing as a parable. A parable uh, comes from the word parabole, P-A-R-A-B-O-L-E is the actual word, uh, we say parable, and it comes from para, para, which is our word parallel, means near, and balo. Balo is our word ball. See, if you, it means to throw. The word ball means to throw. It means to throw down near or put something down beside something else to show what this means here. It actually is a pointer. As I said, look back at the first chapter of Revelation. Revelation is not as hard as teaching some other things in the Bible. Do you know that teaching Revelation is easier when you define these words? Is easier than teaching the Gospels because the Gospels has so many chapters in it. In it all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the total number of chapters is phenomenal and the number of events and things that happen is tremendous in the Gospels. There's much more to understand in teaching the Gospels than there is in Revelation. I'll say that there's more, um, more items to list and look at in the Gospels. In Revelation, all you have to do is know the meaning of these words and have the, have the resources. If you've got books like the McClinic and Strong, it's a 12-volume set. If you've got... Uh, books like the Hastings I've got over here. That's a 13-volume set. This is a good place to start. And you need books on metaphors of the first century. I've got all kinds of books in my library at home on on uh, Jesus and the Jews in the first century. I've got books like, uh, that's by Emile Scherer. And then I've got uh, uh, the uh, Compendia, uh, the Jews in the first century, volume one and volume two. And any books you can pick up uh, that have uh, customs and manners of the Jews in the first century, you've got to move away from our culture, go back 2,000 years, go over the Atlantic Ocean, settle down in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, look at their language, look at their culture, look at their customs, and we've got, the, we've got the tools. People just don't want to use them. Whenever I'm teaching, I was talking to Greg yesterday, I said, I'm, the Bible is the story of a family. You start off with Adam, and Adam has a son, uh, Enosh, and Enosh has a son, uh, Canaan, and Mahalalel, and, and it goes down the line, and Adam's, if you count down to the tenth from Adam, or the tenth grandson from Adam, the great, 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 great grandson of Adam would be Noah. This is a family. And then you count to the 11th, and that's Shem, his son, and he's second born, second born. And then you count to another 11, count to another 11, or count on down there, uh, just to uh, count down to 20. You count down to 20, and you get to Abraham. So you can say great, 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 say great 20 times, and that is Adam's 20th great-grandson, 
Abraham. And then Isaac, his son, he's second born. And then Jacob. You count 22 from Adam, and Jacob is Adam's great, 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 22 times grandson. This is about a family. I keep saying that. And then, of course, Jacob has, Jacob has all these 12 sons, and they are, you can count each one of them, and they're great, 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 23 times. They're all this 23rd grandson of Adam. It's about a family. That's what Israel is about. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel. And then you have, then you have Joseph, Joseph, Jacob's 11th son, and he ends up in, in uh, bondage in Egypt, and they stay there. They stay there for 400 years. And then Moses comes along and leads them out of bondage. And he goes up on the mountain after 40 years in the wilderness. But at the beginning of the 40 years, he goes on the mountain there in the 19th chapter of Exodus. And he gets the law of God. And then they go back to the promised land. And they're under judges. And all these judges are descendants of Jacob. And the land was given to Abraham. It was given to Abraham back here. When they get to the land, they're going back to repossess the land. And they're ruled by judges, um, people like Othniel and Ehud and Deborah and Jephthah and uh, Gideon and, and uh, uh, Samson. These are the judges all the way down to Samuel. Samuel is the last judge in 1 Samuel. And 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles all these are descendants of these 12 sons of Jacob who became the nation of Israel. And each one of these sons has a tribe. A tribe or a nation within themselves. Each one is a nation. Each one is an army within themselves. So you go for 500 years. You're approximately 300 years under judges. You're 500 years under uh, as a kingdom of God because God was their king and Jesus called himself the I am God of the Old Testament and that's what the Lord said to Moses you tell the children of Israel that I am hath sent me when Jesus said in the 8th chapter of John he said before Abraham was I am and the Jews took up stones to stone him because he was calling himself the I am God of the Old Testament well, this was Jesus ruling these people. He was king of the Jews over here. He said he was their king in Hosea the 13th chapter and the 12th chapter of 1 Samuel. So this is the kingdom of God. And then they, then they are scattered all over the earth because of their apostasy going after Baal and Grove and Golden Calf and, and going after the Shemash and Molech, all of the gods around them, which are the same thing as Baal in the grove, the sun god and the tree goddess, and that's the same system that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ Mass or Christmas. It's paganism. Then they were scattered all over the earth, then they were brought back, and God, they were brought back May 14, 1948. Actually, they were liberated in 1917 by General Allenby, and then 1920, the Balfour Declaration was issued to, for them to become a satellite nation of the British Commonwealth, and that that Balfour Declaration expired May 14, 1948, and they were declared a nation for the first time in 2,600 years when they were scattered back here. So all of this is about a family, but during the time period of this scattering up to the days of Jesus, God says he would going to give them, he's going to give them 70 times 7 to repent of all this apostasy that was going on here. So, he gets 70 times 7 because they had a sabbatical year every 7 years. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They had a sabbatical year every 7 years and they never kept the sabbatical years because they said, we're not going to do without crops to every 7 years. That's uh, too much money. So, that was we're not going to tithe to God. We're not going to give what is rightfully His. And they went for 70 sets of those sabbatical years. So, God says, I'm going to give you 490 years 
That's the 77s of Daniel or the 70 weeks of Daniel, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And then he gives them these 77s to repent. He said, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince, 69 of these weeks would, would, would transpire. And then, then you'd go into a time period. God would blind the eyes of the Jews that's when Jesus comes in Jerusalem in Luke the 19th chapter, 19th chapter. He says, I'll blind the eyes of the Jews and then, and then there'll be a time for the Gentiles or the all flesh or all men to be God's Israel, God's spiritual Israel. It's a family all the way through here and then now it's a spiritual family or it's a spiritual Israel or the church. It's all about God's family. When the Bible says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, whom is a pronoun. It's talking about a people that God, that God prognosco foreknew. Predestination is about God's family in the Bible. Of course, foreknow comes from gnosko, meaning to know intimately beforehand. So God knew all of his people, not just literal Israel, but in everybody in literal Israel wasn't a believer. He said, he said that uh, the election only has obtained this. They're not all Israel which are of Israel. The election has obtained this, and all the rest were blinded. So if you're elect to God, you'll be obedient to him. So when we're teaching the Bible... When you're teaching Revelation, it is a review of all of this. It's a review of it because you've got 24 elders in the fourth chapter of Revelation. The 24 elders are the 24 sons of, of Moses' older brother, Aaron. Aaron was three years older than Moses, and he had 24 sons by Ithamar and Eliezer. So you, got, you have that over there in the fourth chapter of Revelation. You've got, they had crowns upon their foreheads. You get that out of the 28th chapter of Exodus. They wore crowns on their foreheads that said holiness to the Lord. And we see a picture of these 24 families casting their, their crowns at Jesus' feet because he's the priest of this temple of God. And they're saying... They're acquiescing to him, saying, we cannot judge the human temple and know you're not that your body is the temple, and we're spiritual Israel and spiritual Jews. The book of Revelation is an opening up of all this that I just put on the board. It's a, it tells you that. In fact, you've got Jesus standing amidst the seven candlesticks in the first chapter of Revelation. What are the seven candlesticks and where did they come from? Well, they come out of Exodus, the 25th chapter. It's a Jewish thing. The book of Revelation is Jewish. All you have to do is study everything you can in that book. I mean, spend years and years and years and, and uh, look up every word, every culture, every custom, and you'll find out what it means. Now, we've been talking about Revelation and the bottomless pit. We've been talking about Gog and Magog. That all goes back to the Old Testament. Uh, look here in this first chapter. The first chapter, and I'm going to read to you the first three verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, not revelations with an S, the revelation. This book is the revelation of Christ. The word revelation is the word apocalypsis, A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. It comes from apo and calypto. Apo means a removal of... And calypto means the cover. When you remove the cover, you reveal, and apocalypto is the word revealed. Revealed. So this is the revealing of Jesus Christ. Now let's continue to read. Which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now he's going to, Jesus is going to show unto his servants. Who is that? That's the church. And sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. John was on the Isle of Patmos. That's over here, just off the 
west coast of what we call Turkey. That was called Asia Minor. It's a little island right out here off the coast there. And that's where John had his great revelation and wrote this book. And it says, He sent and signified it by his angel. Now that word signify tells you what the book is about. Signify is the word semi-i-o, S-E-M-E-I-O-O. -O. It comes from the word simeon. Simeon is the word sign all through the New Testament Scripture. It means a flag, a beacon, or a pointer. So all of these, all of these, this what seems to be, I hate to use the word apocalyptic, because you wouldn't use the word apocalyptic language the way the world uses it. When people think of ap apocalyptic language, what do they think of? Something mysterious, something you can't understand. Apocalyptic comes from the word apocalypse, or apocalypse, ap apocalypsis, which is the word revelation. It means to take the cover off. The way, w the way men have used the word apocalyptic they mean something that's fuzzy and hazy. If you take the cover off, it's not fuzzy and hazy anymore, is it? Start defining the words. So he goes on to say, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. Now notice verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now he says, blessed are those that read, and they hear this word. That word here, akuo, means to understand, or it means to be obedient to. Uh, A-K-O-U-O -O is the word here, here, and it means to understand or to obey. When you understand, they, have, they said to hear was to obey in the Middle East. So, akuo means to understand. Well, how in the world could you understand? God did not give us a book in the book of Revelation, one that God says it's just too hard. I can't understand Revelation. I don't want to read that. It's because of what you've heard from people. You've heard it from preachers. You've heard it from these so-called doctors of theology. They don't know anything about it because they don't look the things up. When he says, blessed is he that reads and understands, now if you get over to the ninth chapter of Revelation and you see locusts that are like scorpions. Locusts. I'm misspelling. Locusts like scorpions. Now he says, blessed are those that read and understand. Now Hal Lindsey says that the locusts like scorpions are helicopters. He wrote that in some books, that these locusts are helicopters. Now wouldn't that be ridiculous to write that third verse, blessed is he that reads and understands, it's because you cannot, but you're not going to be able to understand until the 1930s because they didn't invent helicopters until the early 1930s. So only people who are born after the 1930s are going to be able to understand the ninth chapter of Revelation. That's ridiculous, isn't it? I'm sorry, but John, you can't understand this. Nobody you're going to write to is going to be able to understand this because you've got to get on down 2,000 years of the road before you can understand it because you got to, I've got to invent some helicopters before this is over. It's ridiculous. We know that locusts, when you look at a word, don't run to the next word until you find out what this word means. When you see locust, it always denoted among the Hebrews famine. And then that takes you back all through the Old Testament where God says, I will send famine, I'll send pestilence, I'll send the sword, and I'll send the beast to carry you into captivity if you, and I'll send this Famine, pestilence, and the sword over and over. When you see famine, usually it either came with no rain or too much rain, too much, much rain, or uh, it would come with locust or something that would eat up the crops. That's what you see locust. Well, locust 
they would come in the hundreds of millions, uh, maybe in the billions, and they said they'd cover the land, they would cover the sky about 20 miles long, sometimes five miles wide, and it'd be so many miles deep, and they would come and just annihilate all the crops. So when you see locust, you have to define what that is. Then you see scorpion, you have to define the Greek word is scorpios. Scorpios, and anybody in the first century understood this. And scorpios is the noun, and then you had a verb form of the noun, scorpizo. And scorpizo was the verb form, and that's the word that Jesus would use when he would speak of scattering the flock, scatter sheep, and in John 10 he gives you the parable of the good shepherd, and it says the hireling, the man who preaches for money, he cares not for the sheep. He allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. That word scatter is the verb form of scorpion. And wolves are false teachers. And if you go to the Middle East and you ask people, what, do you call a, what is this you call a man who's a slick-talking person that will try to beat you out of your money? They say, we call him a scorpion. That's what we call a con man here in the Middle East because they live in a desert. So that is a, So you're talking about you're talking about something has exact meaning to those people in the first century. And that's not even hard to find. Open up your concordance, look under scorpion, and then go down the line and you'll get to Exod you'll get Ezekiel, the second chapter. And Ezekiel is over there in Babylon. And in, the Lord tells Ezekiel, you dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words. Scorpions speak false words. That's not hard, is it? If you know what a scorpion is, and locusts take the real... But without defining words, you're not going to know. Locusts destroy the food of the people. And if you never define the word law in the Greek, you won't understand. You won't understand how scorpions are like locusts. When you define the word law, I didn't define the word law when I looked up scorpion. I'd already known what the word law meant a long time before that. The word law is the word nomos. And it means legally prescribed food for animals. Well, if scorpions are false teachers, they're destroying the food of the sheep, aren't they? And the scorpion and the locust are, de are destroying the literal food, so they both do the same thing. The, the locusts block the light. The false teachers block the light, which is Christ and the Word of God. That's really basic, isn't it? It's very basic. That's why teaching Revelation is a lot easier because it gives you a lot of words to look up and find out what does this mean. Now, we see the scorpions of the false teachers coming out of the bottomless pit. That's why we know it's not a nuclear explosion. False teachers don't come out of a nuclear explosion, do they? No. If they came out of a nuclear explosion, then nobody in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 10th century, uh, nobody for the first 19th centuries would be able to understand the smoke from the bottomless pit because, because it, with, they didn't invent nuclear power until the 20th century, would they? So nobody would be able to read and understand the ninth chapter if the smoke out of the pit, remember the word blind, blind is the word tuflos. It, come, it is a der derivative of the word tufao. It means to be slowly consumed by smoke, slowly smoke, with no fire, and they expressed, they expressed conceit this way. They said he is consumed by smoke with no fire. That was the way they expressed it. It's not that hard if you just look things up. Revelation gives you a lot more things to look up than some of the other writers because you got a lot of these things that look real weird. That's real apocalyptic. That's real, gosh, I can't understand that. Well, certainly you can't understand it. I mean, I can't understand dentistry if I, if I get, Anthony, get Anthony to let me come in his, uh, 
in where he works and does fix his teeth out there at the VA. I, let me try that. Tony, can I do that? No, you can't. Well, I think I can. You can't without learning what it's about. You can understand Revelation if you learn what the words mean. Once you get all these definitions, it's like a breeze. Now, where we are, we're over here in the 20th chapter of Revelation. 20th and 21st chapter. Let me go to the 21st chapter. I'll work my way back to the 20th because I started on this 21st chapter last week. When you're reading something in the Bible, look in your concordance. If you got one online, just go online and start going through and scanning a word. Scan I just take my concordance out and sit down on the just sit down on the couch and sometimes I just go down and looking for certain things. And I say, huh, I think that that sounds like something I've read over here. Look up phrases to see if they're found somewhere else in the Bible. I was looking at a phrase last night, and I said, I hadn't seen this before, and I had three or four other places I'd seen it. If you see something over and over and over, you can pretty well bet that it is a saying or an idiom in the first century. If you see something said over and over, you'll notice that Paul will use the use the word without. Jesus used the word without. When Jesus was in the house, there in Mark the second chapter, and there were four men waiting to see him, and they couldn't get inside because the pressure of the people was too great, so they went up on the house, and uh, they were without. Without meant outside. Then Jesus said concerning his... Uh, there was another time he was in a house and it was so crowded that his brothers and sisters were outside the house and one of the apostles got in and said, your brothers and sisters are without. That meant outside. And then Paul says in, at the end of chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, what have I to do to judge those that are without? That means outside the church. I'm not judging Rome I'm not going to judge the Caesars. I'm not going to judge the president or who's running for president. I don't have anything to do with them. I don't vote for them anymore and I voted for Caesars. So you, if you see something said over and over and over, you'll notice it comes from somewhere and you'll see this here. He says, I saw new heaven and new earth. <clears throat> First of all, you need to look up the word heaven. You need to look it up. If you can get you some Jewish encyclopedias, look up heaven. We as Gentiles know of three heavens. The Jews said there were seven heavens. We know of the heavens wherever God is, and the way you're going to have to interpret which heaven it's talking about is by the context of Scripture. You have to learn Scripture and learn the context. So we know of the heavens where God is, the heaven where God exists, and I don't know where that is. Where God is. I want to end that with a verb. Uh, and then, then there's the heaven above us. And that's the atmosphere or where the birds fly or going up to the stratosphere. Birds fly or go out into space. And we know of that heaven. It just depends on how it's used in context. Then you have the heavens. The heaven that is the ruling class. They rule, and that would be governors. That would be our government, president, Washington, D.C. Nashville would be a heavens for this state that we live in. Heavens ruled, and then you had something opposite of that. That was called the earth the earth, and the earth was the ruled. And whenever you think of this, think of, think of heaven and earth. I've said this before that whenever a man would say, I'll, I'll move heaven and earth to get to that woman. I'll move heaven and earth to make this business go. 
the heavens with the ruling class. And what he's saying, I'll move companies or, or kingdoms or nations to get what I want in life. And the earth is the one you rule. Now, I said it last week. Anytime you see heaven in the text of Scripture, notice what it's talking about. Look back again to Matthew 5. I want to give you to this one more time. <clears throat> Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Jesus is on the mountains preaching his first message called the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, he sees the multitude, went up into a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, is is a being verb. And is is used with singular when you say, he is, she is, they are. Be as am, or was, were, being, be, and so forth. That's the being verbs. So he says, theirs is, and is is present tense. Kingdom of heaven was a term for Israel. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God was the same thing because God was their king. God. In about 200 B.C., the rabbis dropped the term God and put the word heaven in. And Matthew uses kingdom of heaven more often than than Mark, Luke, and John. And Mark and Luke and John use more often kingdom of God. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor is the word P-T-O-C-H-O-S. When Jesus, Jesus used the same word when he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me in Luke 4.18. For the Lord hath sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. It means emptied out in essence. Now, the only way you're emptied out is God has to empty you because you're born full of self. So you have to be emptied of self. Somewhere along the way, God's going to be emptying his people by putting them through fire and trials, and they're going to get tired of themselves before it's over with. So he says, blessed is the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or theirs is the heavens. And that is, the heavens was the ruling class. Was Israel the ruling class? Were they the ruling class? Look at Deuteronomy. Hold your place here. Look at Deuteronomy 28. Look at Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Could Israel rule everybody? They could have ruled anybody they wanted to. As long as they were obedient to God, they were the ruling class. They were the heavens. And this is why. Deuteronomy 28. Twenty-eight. Now, he's talking about being obedient to God. And he says, It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field, and blessed shall be the fruit of thy body. This is it when you're obedient to God, Israel. And the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. When you go out to gather the crops, your basket will be overflowing, and your storehouses will be overflowing. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Now look at verse 7. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. Well, does it matter how much Israel is outnumbered? Does not matter. We see Israel attacking the Syrians in the 20th chapter of 1 Kings, and Israel had 7,000 fighting men 
and the Assyrians had over 120,000, and they encamped against the Syrians like two little flocks of kids or two little flocks of goats, and the Syrians covered the plain, and here's Israel, and God says, and Ahab says, who's going to give the uh, order to attack? And the prophet says, you are. Because this Ben-Hadad has come up and said that he's going to conquer my people and wants an unconditional surrender. He says, I'm going to show him that he can't come up against my people just any time he wants to. And, and Samson took the jawbone of an ass and killed a thousand men in one day by himself. Didn't need any help. No help wanted. That is phenomenal other than the fact when God's people were obedient to him, they were the heavens. That's the whole point. Look over here in, in Deuteronomy 32. Look at 32 and 30. And he, this is what God said he would do. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up. If God shuts you up and protects you, you can take two men and put 10,000 to flight. That's the way God works. It's not. You remember in the 14th chapter, those of you that have been here, 14th chapter of 1 Samuel, and one of the most righteous men in Israel that day was Jonathan, the son of Saul. And Saul was wicked. And he was the king of Israel. And Jonathan went out, and Saul was over there. His father was over there hiding in a cave. And Jonathan said, there is a promise from God. We can whip our enemies. And Jonathan believed God. And Jonathan was hiding in a place called Michmash in the caves. Uh, there was, it was a big cliff, rocky area. And Jonathan told his armor bearer, who was the best fighter in his unit, he would have to be his armor bearer, and he would tell his armor bearer, men, you're going to climb up this wall. And if they reach, if the Philistines reach their hand out and say, come on up, he said, me and you are going to kill everybody up there on that top of that cliff. His armor bearer didn't say, what if there's 500 of them? Jonathan would have said, we're going to kill all of them. There was 20. And they got up there and just killed 20 guys. Zap, 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 zap. And they're dead. That's because Israel, when they had believers, and Jonathan was a believer, they were the heavens. Look over here in, look over here in, uh, in Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30. Was, were they the heavens? Well, sure they were. Did they give up being the heavens? Yes. And that goes to the ten horns. But don't have time for that. Isaiah 30. You got so many illustrations of where God would deliver Israel if when they were obedient to Him. Look here at Isaiah 30. Look here in 30 and 17. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee. He says, When you forsake me, I'll cause you to flee from your enemies. But it doesn't matter how many they are, and it don't matter how big they are. That's why when Israel left Egypt, and they got up here to Kadesh Barnea, and God tells them to go in there to the land of the A land of Anak, and the Anakims were these giants in what we call the Gaza Strip. It was called the old land of the Philistines. It was called Anak back then. And the people come back, and they said, we can't conquer these giants. They're... they're they're giants over there, and they're too big. God had just got through destroying the greatest army in the world he, when he put them down in the bottom of the Red Sea and pulled the wheels off their chariots, and that was Pharaoh and his armies. And God can't, can't cause them to conquer these, these giants in the land? When David went out against Goliath, when David went against Goliath, here's David, just a real fast-moving kid, then he's... Uh, and he's probably about 17 years old. You had to be 20 to be in the army. And he was very good with a slingshot. He could, hit a hair, he, he could hit a hair's breadth at 50 yards. Most of those shepherds could. He said, I can kill him. 
He is no problem at all. I have killed a bear and a lion. I'll go against him and I'll kill him for you, King Saul. And he did. It didn't matter how big they were. That meant Israel was the heavens as long as they were obedient. But look over here in Deuteronomy 28. He says in verse 15, you're going to lose in your, you're going to lose your heavens. He says here in verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments. Did they do that? No, they never did. 500 years as a nation, they turned away and went after other gods, and this is what God said he would do to them. If you don't observe to do all my commandments and statutes, which I commanded this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, you'll be cursed in the field, you won't have good crops, you'll go out to gather, and you'll put it in a bucket with holes in it. That's what Haggai said. And it'll be gone. You'll plant, you'll gather, and there'll be nothing there. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. You'll, have bre- you'll go out to get a lot and you'll get a little. And your storehouses will be empty when you're disobedient to me. Cursed shall thou be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing. It's the Lord that's going to do this. The charismatic say God won't do that. Say God won't hurt nobody. He especially won't hurt his people. He said, I'll destroy you. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation. God's going to do it. I believe he's going to destroy America. We're headed down. We're not going to come out of this recession. Don't. Does anybody believe that when these guys are running for office? We owe 14 to $16 trillion. We couldn't come out of that the longest day. Our grandkids, if we didn't borrow any more money, our great-grandkids can't get us out of it. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand to do until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me, God says. He's talking to Israel. The Lord shall make pestilence cleave unto thee. People, Ben Hinn says God won't make anybody sick. I think pestilence is disease, isn't it? Besides that, Micah 6, 13, Therefore will I make thee sick in smiting thee because of thy sins. Boy, it sounds like America's in trouble. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he hath consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with consumption, with a fever, and with inflammation, with extreme burning. God's going to do the smiting. not, And he'll use evil men to do it. With extreme burning, with sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head, this is the heaven that's above your head. He's not talking about the heavens that's the rulers this time. That's why I put in heavens that's above your head. He said shall be brass. There won't be any rain. That's what he's saying. And the earth that is under thee shall be iron. When you do without rain for a long time and the sun bakes that ground, I was raised out in West Texas. And you go west to Fort Worth where I was raised. And when it, you go into a drought, that ground, it'll have ruts where when it was muddy, they'd go through the ruts and then it'll cake up, and big old deep ruts, and it'll be so hard, it'll be hard as iron. You can't break it. You can get a pick out there and you can't hardly break it. It's just solid. And this is what God says will happen when you're disobedient to me. But notice what he says. Israel is going to lose their heavens when they do this. They're not going to be the heavens anymore because there's going to be new heaven. New ruling class. The Lord shall make rain, make the rain of thy land powder. That's the best rain you're going to get. It's going to be dust. And thus, from heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Then he says, this is the exact opposite of verse 7 of the same chapter. You'll go against your enemy one way and they'll feed seven ways when you're the heavens. 
when you're not the heavens and you're not the ruling class anymore, the way they ceased to be the heavens was by going after other gods. The way they were the heavens was by serving God. And this is true in our lives. The way that we are the heavens, the way we rule people is when we study the word, stay in the truth, and we're always ready to give an answer to people. It's like a sword we take out and cut them down and they want to run away from us when they see us in public. So they're going to cease to be the heavens and this verse says so. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. He said in verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. When you're obedient to me, but when you're not obedient, you're going to lose the heaven's position. You're not going to be the heavens anymore. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed unto all the kingdoms of the earth. And that's the beast coming in, isn't it? So that's when, who is the heavens then? Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece. Rome. Do you know that the Roman Empire could not have whipped Israel if they'd been obedient to God? No way. They couldn't be beaten it because Israel was the heavens as long as they were obedient. And so are we the heavens. Now, remember the verse there in Revelation when he says, I saw, John saw new heavens and new earth? He's talking about the church. Because let's back up to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. Now Isaiah's book is talking about Israel ceasing to be the heavens and the Gentile church becoming the heavens. We're the heavens now. We rule with the scepter of righteousness. We rule with the word of God. We drive people away from us. We're not ruling a literal kingdom. Jesus said, if my kingdom were this world, then would my servants fight. Didn't he say that? Now, Isaiah is talking about through the whole book about the Gentiles coming to the light and in a sense being the heavens or being the ruling class. In fact, look back. Before we look at this 65th chapter, before we look at that, let's back up to the 42nd chapter. He's talking about the Gentiles who did not receive the truth from Jesus, I mean from Adam, Adam until Christ. The Gentiles, which is everybody that's not a Jew, they were forbidden from receiving the word of God. God would tell the leaders of Israel, slaughter them. Slaughter the people at Amalek. Go in here and slaughter these Moabite kings. Go in here and kill these pagan kings. But the Gentiles were in darkness. And the word prison is the word fulake. It means the division of day and night or light and darkness. Light and dark. And the spirits in prison were the Gentiles who were in darkness. And by the resurrection they were preached to. So God comes to the Gentiles in Acts 2, and that's the birth of God's spiritual kingdom, spiritual Israel, the church. The church. And at this birth of spiritual Israel, this is God's new heaven. He says so here. He says so. I'm going to get to the new heavens because the new heavens is the church. But before we get to that, let's see what Isaiah has to say. He says here in verse 6, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Mr. Isaiah is telling us that the Gentiles are going to come to the light when he blinds the eyes of the Jews when Christ comes in Jerusalem God is prophesying way ahead of time what he's going to do and what Israel is not going to do because he's going to have their eyes blinded so they can't see, their ears deafened so they can't hear. He said that in the 6th chapter of Isaiah. He said, I'm going to get them eyes they can't see and ears they can't hear lest they should be converted and I should heal them. I don't want them. They're not mine. 
Then he says, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and then they sit in darkness out of the prison house. I keep saying that Isaiah was the Old Testament Paul because Paul said, God has sent me to bring the Gentiles to the light in that 26th chapter of Acts. He sent me to bring the Gentiles to light. Isaiah is prophesying about, prophesying about the Gentiles becoming to the light, but the Gentile church is going to be the new heavens. And then Isaiah, over here in the 60th chapter, he's got it all through here. I don't know if i got time. 49th chapter. He says, uh, and he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Says the same thing in verse 9, That thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth to them that are in darkness, Show yourselves, they shall feed in the ways, and pastures shall be in the high places. And look over here in the 60th chapter. Chapter 60. <clears throat> in verse 3, the Gentiles shall come to thy light. Chapter 5, uh, the last phrase, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto the Lord or come unto thee. Chapter, uh, chapter 60, verse 11. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles. Then he says in verse 16, Thou shalt suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings. And he says over here in 61 and 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus quoted this in Luke 4, 18 is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound or to the Gentile. The Gentile elect church. He, there's an exact people in the Gentile elect church. That's God's heavens now. Then he says in verse 9 of chapter 61, Their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, the seed of Israel. And that's us. Let's go to chapter 65. I said all that just to build up. I do series on the spirits in prison. Spirits in prison are the Gentiles being in darkness all that time, and now God has brought them to the light. That's the Gentile church. that is an exact number. God's predestinated to elect in the Gentile church, and we are the heavens now. Look at this. So Isaiah's prophesying the downfall of Israel and that there will be a New Testament Gentile Israel, which is the church. That's how the Gentiles come to the light. Then he says in verse 60, chapter 65, verse 1, this is quoted in Romans 10 and 20. Paul is writing to a Gentile church in Romans 10 and 20. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. That's the Gentiles, isn't it? I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. He's talking about Gentiles, isn't he? In fact, look at Romans 10. Look at Romans 10. He says, the, and Paul is writing to a Roman Gentile church, isn't he? Romans 10, verse 20. But Esaias, or Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. Paul is writing this to a Gentile church, and this is going to become the heavens or the new heavens. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Now, let's go back over here. Let's go back over here to, to uh, Isaiah 65. Notice this is not a bunch of separate verses. It's a condemnation of Israel for going after idol gods, and then he, then he moves into the Gentiles in this chapter. And he's concerning the Gentiles, that's when he says the first time. Well, let's just read that verse first. Remember the verse over there. Let me read it to you. In Revelation 21, I saw new heaven and new earth. Now let's go to Isaiah 65. Verse 17, for I create new heavens and new earth. What is that about? It's about the 21st chapter of Revelation.
But to understand this verse, I saw new heaven and new earth, you have to go back to the first. You have to see what Isaiah is about. Isaiah is talking about the Gentiles coming to the light all the way through the book. All through the book. Isaiah is prophesying the church. In other words, he's prophesying that southern Judah, northern Israel will fall, southern Judah will fall. Did Israel stumble merely to stumble there in Romans 11, 11? No. They stumbled so that salvation would come to the Gentiles. God saw to it that they would stumble and reject him. He saw to it. He deafened their ears, blinded their eyes. Then he says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. And I said, Behold me, look at me, look at me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Gentiles. <clears throat> I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Remember, 500 years, 1 Samuel, 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. Israel rejected God as a nation. They kept going after all these idols. Out of all these kings, only two of them, or three of them were righteous. <clears throat> all these kings of Israel, here's Saul, David, and Solomon. That's when they had one kingdom under Solomon's uh, rule. In the 11th chapter of 1 Kings, they went after idols. They, he married 700 pagan wives and 300 concubines. I, one wife is hard enough to deal with, isn't it? 700 <laughs> David's fixing to go somewhere and 700 women are saying I have to go put on my makeup <laughs> Woo. and then the nation was split because of Solomon's apostasy and of all of these kings of northern Israel and southern Judah only three David Hezekiah and Josiah were right, totally righteous no others all the rest of them that's how they lost their heaven position let's keep reading this I'm sought of them that ask not for me. Well, I read that. I've spread out my hands all day unto a rebellious people, Israel, which walketh in a way that was not good. Going after Baal Grove, didn't keep their sabbatical years. After their own thoughts, a people that provoketh me to anger continually. Israel. In gardens, and burneth incense on altars of brick, they're burning incense unto Baal and the grove and Shemosh and Molech, which remain among graves and lodge and monuments. They eat swine's flesh. They're not even keeping the dietary laws. God, does God care if the pagans eat swine's flesh? Do they, does God care if the pagans ate ham and bacon? Pork chops. Nope, he didn't care. He's talking about Israel. Now, I'm not telling you don't eat bacon and pork chops. God has cleansed all food now. Which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. And this is what Israel says. Which say, they were saying this at Rome. Remember they had a polemic situation at Rome? They had the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers at Rome and the Jewish believers had evidently raised themselves above a little above the Gentile believers. And Paul said, we're all alike. All have sinned. When he said all have sinned, that's what he's talking about. Jew and Gentile. And this is what Israel says. Which say, stand by thyself. Get away from me. Come not near me, for I am holier than you, because I am an Israelite, and God loves me. That's what they were saying. And God says, I don't like that attitude. <laughs> These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will keep not keep silence, but will recompense Israel for what they've done. Even recompense into their bosom. It's going to be like fire in their bosom. You can't take fire in your bosom and not get burned. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains. And where they burned that incense, they called the high places. That's where they kept their tree goddesses outside the cities. They'd go out there and burn incense to Grove, to Ashtaroth, to all the female deities. Israel was doing this. Israel, who would led out of, and God kept saying, 
I led you out of Egypt, out of captivity, and you're still doing this. Is America doing this? Is the so-called church doing it in America? That's not the church. Those Baptist churches and Pentecostal churches and Church of Christ down the street, that's not the church. The church is the called out. And we're called out of this world to live righteously and godly. You burn incense upon the mountains and blaspheme me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. I'm going to pour it back upon you, Israel. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy all of them. When Nebuchadnezzar came in to destroy destroy Israel and carry southern Judah into captivity, he said, Leave the poor there. Tell this Jeremiah he was such a righteous man. Nebuchadnezzar, commanding general, you go over and tell him he can come to, you. he was a righteous man. He tried to warn people about me coming over there and I had every right to come over there, Nebuchadnezzar says, because I was their keeper. They were a vassal nation. They were a servant nation. All they had to do was pay tribute to Babylon and we protected them against everybody. And they turned away from me and went to Pharaoh Necho in Egypt and said, we're going over there for our protection. He says, You've broken your vow with me, not only with your God, but with me. Nebuchadnezzar had every reason to go over to, Bab to, go over to Israel to do exactly what he did. Israel wasn't faithful to anybody, not even up on the earth, much less God. Now, he says, we're still talking about, so he's rejecting Israel here, isn't he? And he says, I'm going to go to a nation that wasn't called by my name. That's Gentiles. And watch how he works it in. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servant shall dwell there. His elect, Peter said, make your calling and election sure. And he tells the Thessalonians, you're the elect of God. And Peter says again, we're elected unto obedience in the sprinkling of blood. And he says, And Sharon be a fold of flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. I'm going to save the ones that have sought me, and I'm going to destroy the ones that haven't. But ye are they that forsake the Lord. He's talking to Israel. You've forsaken God, and you've been the heavens that forget my holy mountain reminds me of Psalms, the 15th chapter. He said, you've forgotten my holy mountain. What's the holy mountain of God? Zion, where Jerusalem sits, where the temple sits. That's God's holy mountain. But he said, you've forgotten my holy mountain, where the law is. And Israel was ignoring it. Look at Psalms, the 5th chapter, Psalms 5. Oh, 15, not 5. Psalms 15. Psalms 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill, in your holy mountain? Who's going to dwell? Aren't we come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church? of the firstborn, Hebrews 12, 22. Isn't that where we're come to? We're come to Mount Zion. We inherit God's holy mountain because here's what he says. Who's going to inherit his holy mountain? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. He that doeth righteousness is righteous and speaketh the, tr and speaketh the truth in his heart. <clears throat> he that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbor nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt. You'll have contempt for Kenneth Gopin. People that don't have contempt for a man that steals from the poor, they're vile themselves. But he honoreth them that, swear, that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt, and changes not. Say, I will stand for truth, and you can kill me if you want to, but I will not change. 
like a tree that's planted by the rivers of waters. We will stand and not be moved. He said, that's who will hear it and God's hold him out. And he that putteth not out his money to usury or excessive interest rates, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. That's who's going to inherit the mountain of God or God's Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. Now let's go back over here to the 65th chapter of Isaiah. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, that furnish drink offerings unto that number. Troop is the word ged. It means to distribute fortunes. It has the same meaning as demon. It is believed we get our word God from that. It's a misapplication of the word. And then he says, you pour out drink offerings to that number, mene. And the moon numbered the seasons in Mene, M-E-N-I is another name for Allah, the tree god. And Allah comes from Alon, which is an oak tree. And God speaks of Israel here in this 44th chapter of Isaiah, talks about Israel making a god of an oak tree. And he said, you've gone out and you've, you have worshipped they were worshiping Allah. We're talking about 700, over 700 years, over a thousand, right at a thousand years, a thousand years before Muhammad was even born. <laughs> they were worshiping Allah. All Muhammad did was, he was, uh, he was the Constantine of Islam. He brought many, many gods together out of their culture and made it a, monogamous religion, one God, made it Allah. But Allah was long before, long before Muhammad or the invention of, of Allah. He was a tree God in the ancient world. He was a moon God. And Mene, it was the moon that numbered the seasons. And on the flags of the Turkish people who are Muslims, you see the crescent moon. You see that also on the fezes of the of the Shriners. So that's the same thing as Mene. Therefore will I number you to the sword. He's talking to Israel. Did he number them to the sword? Yes, the Assyrians came in and carried northern Israel away in 722 B.C. They carried, the Babylonians came in and carried southern Judah away in 586 B.C. And then they were under the rule of the Persians, the, uh, the Mede-Persian Empire, under the rule of the Grecian Empire, and under the rule of Rome in the New Testament. Therefore will I number you to the sword, Israel, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. You ignored me, Israel. When I spake, you did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not, worshiping all these idol gods. The same system that was brought in the church are renamed Christ Mass. You think if God's going to say these kind of things to Israel, it's okay with Him if we do the same thing, keep the rituals of these same gods He's condemning them for? Is that okay? No, it's not. The reason preachers don't preach against Christmas, Christ Mass, Roman Catholicism, is they don't know nothing about the Old Testament. God is hammering Israel here, isn't he? Over the system that Constantine brought in the church in 325 A.D. and renamed the Feast of Saturn, Christ Mass. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat. My servants shall eat. Who's his servants? Those that don't rebel against him. Those that he's put it in their hearts to be obedient to him. His elect, his predestinated family, but ye shall be hungry, behold, my servants shall drink. But ye shall be thirsty, behold, my servants shall rejoice. But ye shall be ashamed, behold, my servants shall sing. Notice what he's doing. He's pitting his servants, which is the Gentile church, against Old Testament Israel. Isn't he? That's what he's doing all through here. 
Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. Now look real close at verse 15. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. You're going to leave Israel as a curse to you, but you're going to leave it to my chosen. And he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world in Ephesians 1 and 4. John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. His servants are going to be the new heavens. That's what he's saying here. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten. That's a real important phrase. What are the former troubles? All that Israel did when they were a nation. This is going to be forgotten. The former troubles is the things that happened first. All of Israel, 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. Israel going after idols. That's going to be forgotten when I call my people by another name. Gentile church, the new heavens. Gentile church. New heavens, new heavens. Spiritual Israel. That's what he says here. Look at it. He says, The former troubles are forgotten because they are hid from mine eyes. For behold, I create new heavens. What is he talking about through this whole chapter? He's talking about my new heavens is going to be a people that haven't been called by my name. It's going to be a nation that I have not called and I'm going to be sought of them that didn't that didn't seek after me because I'm going to call my heavens, which is the New Testament church. Do you see that? He didn't just say this out of the clear blue sky. He's not talking about a new heavens above. However, I believe he will cause all this to melt. It all depends on the chapter. He is Revelation 21.1 is quoting this right here. And what is the whole, what is the whole attitude of Isaiah through this chapter? Going to reject literal Israel. They, went at, they have displeased me. They've gone after other gods. And I'm calling my people, my heavens, by a new name. You see that? And if you don't know that a heaven was, how much time do I have? 20. Let me just read this to you again. I'm going to create new heavens and new earth. I read this before. This is out of McClinic and Strong. You look up heaven and get down to the end of it and it'll say heaven and earth. Heaven and earth is an expression for the whole creation, Genesis 1.1. In prophetic language, the phrase often signifies the political state or condition of persons of different ranks in the world. Heaven and earth is talking about political state and ranks of people in the world. The heaven of the political world is the sovereignty thereof, whose hosts and stars are the powers that, na that rule, namely kings, princes, counselors, magistrates. The earth is the peasantry. It's the peasants. The rich and the wealth of the world are actually peasants, and we rule them. We rule them with the word of God. If you notice, when you start witnessing and talking to people about predestination, election, sovereignty of God, God doesn't love everybody, Christmas and Easter is pagan, people want to get out of your way, don't they? They do not want to talk. I witness to people just about every day, two or three out in public. And I was witnessing to a lady there and just like, well, that's real nice and just as quick as I went into scorpions, what they were, and somehow she said, I saw you on TV and so I, Thought I'd, I said, let me show you why people don't understand. So I explained scorpions to her. She looked at me, a real nice Christian looking lady. That's interesting. Well, uh, and she got up and started going somewhere. Not, not really interested. People don't care if there is a truth or not. 
They don't even care if there is a truth. Don't talk to them about truth because they don't care if there is one. There are one, is one, are one, something like that. Heaven and earth is an expression. The earth is the peasantry, the plebes, or the common race of men who possess no power but are ruled by superiors. They're ruled by the heavens. Israel could rule everybody. They gave up their rule as being the heavens. When did they give up their rule? Well, when Ahab and his wife Jezebel bring the Baal and the grove goddess into Israel, Jezebel's father, the prince of Tyre, and they bring it into Israel, and they begin to build temples in Israel for Baal and the grove. And Elijah comes in front of Ahab and says, there'll be no rain for three and a half years. I'm out of here. I'm gone. And the judgment came immediately. And for three and a half years, not one drop of rain fell from heaven. Can you imagine what would have happened to America if that happened? Whew. Then he goes on to say, Of such a heaven and earth we may understand mention to be made in Haggai 2.6 and referred to in Hebrews 12.26. Such modes of speaking were used in Oriental poetry and philosophy. The first Orientals was Israel. Oriental, Orient means East. Occidental means West. An Occident is one from the Western Hemisphere. That's us. We're Occidentals. That is a superior and an inferior. The heavens is the superior. The earth is the inferior. In every part of nature we learn from Maimonides, quoted by Mead, that the Arabians in his time, when they would express a man was fallen into great calamity, it was said, his heaven has fallen to the earth, meaning his superiority or prosperity is much diminished. That's what heaven and earth is. So let's go back over here and finish this. Behold, I create new heavens and new earth because the former things are forgotten. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. What he's talking about as far as God is concerned, Israel's out of the picture. Now, if he wants to convert them at the end of time, people say, well, how's this going to work at the end of time when I preach on prophecy that the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword? They'll be led away captive into all nations there in Luke 21, 24. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The Gentile rule over Jerusalem ceased in the Six-Day War of 1967. They can't come into heaven because they're Jews. Without belief in Christ, Jesus said, No man comes to the Father but by me. They can't go to Jehovah God except through Jesus. They have to believe that Jesus is the I Am. He is the I Am of the Old Testament. When he confronted Moses, when he confronted Joshua, when he confronted the men of the Old Testament, he is Jehovah. I wrestle with the ending of it all because I... I know the Jews can't come into heaven. Israel can't come in just because they're Israel. That's what, look over there in Romans 9. I'll come back to this one second. Look in Romans 9. Look at this. Romans 9. Look in, uh, look in verse 6. Verse 6, chapter 9. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. You're not going to heaven just because you're a literal Israelite. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, He said, Your father's not Abraham. He said, You may be of his seed, but to be called a son of someone, you have to be doing the will of that father. To be called a son, you have to be obeying him. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. What does he mean by that? Isaac was raised from the dead. In the resurrection shall thy seed be called. And Christ was raised from the dead. He was a picture of Christ. 
And then he says over here in, in chapter 11, verse 7, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded according as it is written in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, or sixth chapter. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. God gave Israel the spirit of slumber. Lord, the Lord says to Isaiah, go preach. He says, how long shall I preach? Till the houses are empty, till there's nobody left in the land. You want that kind of a calling? And then they'll want to kill you at the end of it, and they will, Isaiah, and they'll put you in a log and saw you in half. Now go do it. Do you really want the calling of God on your life? Like Isaiah? You want to die with somebody executing you, putting you in a log and cutting you in two, or put you in front of machine guns and cut you down? Is that what we want? That's what it takes to be an Isaiah. He said, you'll have no converts and there'll be no big coliseums for you, Isaiah. So he says in verse 17 of chapter 65, Behold, I create new heavens. That's the Gentile church he's been talking about all through this chapter. A nation that sought me not there in that first part of the chapter. And he says, And I'm going to reject the old heavens, which is Israel, because you've you say, stand not near me, for I'm holier than thou, and you've rejected me for pouring out drink offerings to that troop and pouring out drink offerings to that number there in verse 11. He said, you've rejected me, so I'm rejecting you as being the heavens. For behold, I create new heavens, Gentile church, and new earth, and the earth was the rule, and we will rule them with the word of God, with the scepter of righteousness. And the former, or old Israel, shall not be remembered nor come into mind, but ye shall be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. He's talking about the church. Our rejoicing is with each other. And if you're really in the church in new Israel or the new heavens, you're going to be obedient to God. That's who the new heavens will be. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. What is he talking about? He's talking about when the old Israel was destroyed, there was weeping and crying because this church is not going to be destroyed. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. In that 16th chapter of Matthew. Gates of hell, the gates of a city was the most powerful in the ancient world. The most powerful part of the wall was a big area where they conducted all kinds of business and the gates was the last thing to come down. Gates of a city. They'd, they'd buy and sell sheep and they'd conduct business in there and the gates of, gates of hell will not prevail against the church. It won't come down. There was weeping in Old Testament Israel but even when we die we'll say that's okay. When you bow to God. Now, I'm go back over here to Revelation. I'll come back to that later. Revelation, look at this. Revelation, the 21st chapter. How much time do I have, Mike? Huh? Ten. Gosh, I want to go somewhere else and get started on some other things. So we are God's elect now. But all of God's elect, he's elected us to obedience. He didn't insist. He insisted, but he would bring the sword, the famine, the pestilence. Finally, he brought the beast to carry him off away into captivity, and that was Babylon, and northern Babylon was Assyria, carried him off into captivity. Then they went under the rule of the beast, which was the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, and the Grecian leopard, and the beast with iron teeth there in Daniel 7. They stayed under that rule for 2,600 years till they were brought back. Literal Israel very well can be a time clock that God is using. And there very well may be, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, there very well may be a group. I believe that the closer we get to the end of time, the church will become apostate. The day of the Lord will not come except to come a falling away first. Falling away is the word apostasis. 
and this is talking about the Gentile church, are the heavens. The, the heavens, which will be the Gentile church, the closer we get to, to the end, the worse the apostasy is going to be. Apostasis, a standing upright, is going to be removed from the church, and that's what we have today. We've got the church with all kinds of doctrines. You've got Church of Christ saying you've got to be dipped in water and eat crackers and grape juice in order to go to heaven when you die. And if you're not dipped in water by a Church of Christ preacher, the Pentecostals, a lot of the Pentecostals say you've got to speak in tongues to go to heaven. And that's not even what that's talking about. And then you've got the Catholics say you've got to eat the body of Jesus, the literal body of Christ in the Mass to go to heaven. And yet they get mad at me for getting up and saying this is what each one of them believes. Somebody's wrong. That's right. Either these preachers today are wrong or me and Martin Luther and Thomas Watson and John Bunyan and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and God himself are wrong. One of, one of these is wrong. They think that I'm some kind of a screwball and that I've got some strange way of looking at the Bible. If I have a strange way, so did Thomas Watson who lived 300 years ago. And so did Martin Luther. And so did Charles Spurgeon who believed in predestination. It was on every page of every book that he wrote. And Charles Spurgeon said this thing called Christ's Mass was wickedness. Charles Spurgeon is supposed to be the mentor and the, uh, of the of the Baptist church. You guys don't believe that because he wrote predestination and everything he ever wrote. I love it when he said, God comes to a man and he, this is Spurgeon's words. It's in the book called The Forgotten Spurgeon. He says, he says, he says, you will come. You say, I will not. God says, you will come. And he, you say, I will not. And God puts you through fire and trials and breaks your arm, twisting your arm. He says, you will come. You say, yes, Lord, I will. He says, I knew I could make you say that. I like that. I love that. I know I can make you say, yes, I will. If God wants somebody, he knows how to make them say, I will. Now look over here in Revelation. And let's read that again. This is not the first place, like I said. When you find something spoken, look at where it was spoken the first time. And I saw new heaven and new earth. Is that, it? Is that hard, so hard to understand now? It's not hard at all, is it? But these guys have got heaven coming down, and it's a great big, big red cube, and it's coming down, it's going to hover over the earth, and they interpret all of this literally in this chapter, and they never go to the Old Testament. And all your answers to Revelation, most of them are found in the Old Testament. And then he says, I, John, saw. He says, the first heaven, which was Israel, literal Israel, and the first earth, which was the Gentiles, were passed away. And there was no more sea. We talked about the sea being the place of the abyss or abusos or the bottomless pit, the place of no knowledge. And in the church, there'll be no more sea. To lead the, the sea was a place of evil to the people of the first century. In fact, to the people 4,000 years ago, they believed it was full of demons and all. And I'm not going to go into that again. If you want that on the sea, I've done several messages on that. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Well, he calls literal Jerusalem, Sodom and Egypt, over there in the 11th chapter of Revelation. So he can't be talking about literal Jerusalem. He's talking about we're coming to Mount Zion, Hebrews 10, 22. We're coming to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. Well, if we're heavenly Jerusalem, we're in heavenly Israel, aren't we? And if we're in heavenly Israel, we're the heavens, aren't we? Well, he says that Look at Ephesians, the first chapter. It's just everywhere. It just come to my mind while I was quoting this. Look here. Look here in Ephesians, the first chapter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by my own free will. No, it says by the will of God, doesn't it? 
He was apostle by the will of God, not by his will. To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's blessed us in heavenly places already. We're already blessed in heavenly places. We're already the heavens, aren't we? That's what he's saying here. In heavenly places or in the ruling class places. According he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We have become the heavens. Ephesus is in the heavens. Our conversation, our mode of living is in the heavens. And... I don't have much time left. Do I have any time? <coughs> huh? Two minutes. I'll just read a couple of verses there. And we saw that verse. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. And that was over there in that second chapter of Revelation, a third chapter of Revelation, where he's talking to the church at Philadelphia and him that overcometh, remember that is in verse 12 of chapter 3, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God. Same words, New Jerusalem. What is the New Jerusalem? It's not some cube coming down out of the sky that's got jasper and gold and diamonds and all in it. New Jerusalem's the church. We're heavenly Jerusalem, the church. And then he says there in chapter 21, verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. Tabernacle, skene, means a wife that's useful to her husband. That's the church. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God is the church. New heavens is the church. The, the believing church, not the Catholic church, not the Baptist church. The church in the sense of those that are called out to live righteously and godly. And he says, he says the same thing he says in the 65th chapter of Isaiah when he said there will be no crying and weeping, we'll rejoice with one another. There will be no more destruction of God's Israel and that's what he's talking about. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Most people say, see in heaven we're not going to cry anymore. Well, that's certainly true, but that's not what this is talking about. You can't leave the context of something. Go where you want to go, can you? I've run out of time. I'm going to stay on this subject in Revelation. Are you beginning to see this? You know, all you have to do is go back to the 65th chapter of Isaiah and see what he's talking about before he says, I create new heavens and new earth. He's rejecting Israel, who was the heavens. Were they in control? Yes, as long as they're obedient, God says, nobody can whip you. Nobody. Nobody with... They could come against the United States with all of their, with all of their nuclear power, and they could come with their bows and arrows and beat the socks off of the United States. Because, see, God always helped Israel. He has an arsenal that's bigger than we've got. He's got all these earthquakes and this fire from heaven and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. That, that beats the socks off, off an arsenal out here that's got all kinds of AK-47s. When God says, I don't need that. Like shooting a cap gun at God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like shooting a cap gun at God, yeah. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for truth. Help us to understand this book, Lord. I pray for the people here that you'll strengthen the sheep, make them strong in the truth. I get very discouraged, Lord, at a world that doesn't believe you. I feel, don't feel like I'm alone. I feel like Isaiah and Paul felt. I pray you'll give us strength to continue this work for years to come. Give me personal strength. Lord, if it's according to your mercy, lift up Mary and give her strength. Lord, we pray for the sheep more than anything. 
God will give you praise for all things. Lead us to your elect and open up many doors. The guys that work for the ministry, Mike, Tom, and Dave, and all of us, Lord, help us and strengthen us. We'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen.